Would you be surprised if I told you that preachers often struggle with depression? If you are surprised, it's probably because you're not a preacher. You know, it's true that preachers do struggle sometimes very severely with depression. I think that shocks some people because we have in our minds that preachers are supposed to be these super spiritual men who are always happy and rejoicing in life. And unfortunately, that's not always true. And not only that, but the very uh, vocation of ministry lends itself to seasons of depression more so than any other vocation. And the reason is because ministry is not just work. It's not just mental labor. Uh, It's not necessarily physical labor, but it is a spiritual labor. And that intensifies uh, all the emotions and the heart rendings that go along with life. In this episode, I'd like to talk about Charles Spurgeon's book, Lectures to My Students, specifically his chapter titled, The Minister's Fainting Fits. And by fainting, he doesn't mean your blood sugar gets low and you pass out onto the floor. What he means is the temptation to quit because you're just so discouraged with everything that you can't take it anymore. I've taken the chapter and I've summarized it under three headings. And those three headings are the what's, the why's, and the how's. What causes spiritual depression? Well, the answer may be obvious. (laughs) We usually would probably say people cause spiritual depression, but there's more to it than just that. And though it may seem fairly obvious, I think it helps to hear what Spurgeon described as the causes of spiritual depression. One of those causes is physical affliction. If you do have a physical affliction, don't despair. Understand that our God is sovereign and he has purposefully designed you the way that he has. He has allowed this affliction into your life for a reason. Spurgeon encourages us with these words. The tender-eyed Leah was more fruitful than the beautiful Rachel, and the griefs of Hannah were more divine than the boastings of Penina. So understand that the diseases that you suffer with, the pain that racks your body, are not there to just be a continual uh, visitor of pain and suffering, but God has a purpose in your suffering. Whatever is the purpose, I can't tell you, but I know that there is one. So be encouraged and understand that God is not trying to, to drive you into the ground spiritually and emotionally, but rather he has a plan for you and a purpose behind your suffering. The second cause of spiritual depression, according to Spurgeon, is sedentary habits, (laughs) being a couch potato. You know, the ministry of the word and prayer involves a lot of heart work and involves a lot of mental labor, but it does not involve a lot of physical stress. It is not a very active job preaching uh, or pastoring. I know that when we preach that It can be quite active when you're preaching for 45 minutes, standing and projecting your voice. But uh, from Monday to Sunday, there's, there's not a whole lot of physical activity for the preacher. And sedentary lives, if I may, desk jobs as we call them today, can lend us to uh, a weakness to depression. Spurgeon warned, to sit long in one posture Pouring over a book or driving a quill is in itself a taxing of nature. But add to this a badly ventilated chamber, a body which has long been without muscular exercise, and a heart burdened with many cares, and we have all the elements for preparing a seething cauldron of despair. So not only is spiritual depression caused by physical afflictions, but spiritual depression in preachers is often caused simply because of the ministry itself. Spurgeon put it this way, all mental work tends to weary and to depress, for much study is a weariness of the flesh. But ours is more than mental work, it is heart work, the labor of our inmost soul. How often on Lord's Day evenings do we feel as if 
life were completely washed out of us. When it comes to ministry work as lending itself more to causing depression than any other line of work, one of the reasons for that is because of the loneliness that is inherent in a preaching ministry. As pastors, we labor alone. That doesn't mean we don't have help. We obviously have assistance in the church and church members come to help us with different duties. But think about it. You are the pastor. There is no other pastor of the church. In that regard, you do labor alone. You are, you are by yourself as pastor. Spurgeon explained, a minister fully equipped for his work will usually be a spirit by himself, above, beyond, and apart from others. The most loving of his people cannot enter into his peculiar thoughts, cares, and temptations. In the ranks, men walk shoulder to shoulder with many comrades, but as the officers rise in rank, men of his standing are fewer in number. There are many soldiers, few captains, fewer colonels, but only one commander-in-chief. So, in our churches, the man whom the Lord raises as a leader becomes, in the same degree, a solitary man. The mountaintops stand solemnly apart and talk only with God as he visits their terrible solitudes. When it comes to ministry work, another, another area to watch out for regarding spiritual depression are those moments before great achievement. If we're not careful, uh, before there is some great victory in our ministry or in our lives, right before that, there can be a, a, a season of spiritual depression. Listen to Spurgeon's words as he describes his own experience shortly before he was catapulted into unimaginable ministry fame. He said, Such was my experience when I first became a pastor in London. My success appalled me, and the thought of the career which it seemed to open up so far from elating me cast me into the lowest depth. Who was I that I should continue to lead so great a multitude? I would betake me to my village obscurity or immigrate to America and find a solitary nest in the backwoods where I might be sufficient for the things which would be demanded of me. It was just then that the curtain was rising upon my life work and I dreaded what it might reveal. I hope I was not faithless, but I was timorous and filled with a sense of my own unfitness. I dreaded the work which a gracious providence had prepared for me. Not only the moments before a great achievement are moments of danger for depression, but also the moments that come right after those seasons of great victory. Those likewise can be times of very dangerous, dark valleys for the preacher. Spurgeon reminds us of Elijah's example where he says, See Elias after the fire has fallen from heaven, after Baal's priests have been slaughtered and the rain has deluged the barren land. For him, no notes of self-complacent music, no strutting like a conqueror in robes of triumph. He flees from Jezebel and feeling the revulsion of his intense excitement, he prays that he may die. An especially powerful foe against us in this battle against depression is the foe of extreme disappointment and a broken heart. Spurgeon describes it this way. The brother most relied upon becomes a traitor. Judas lifts up his heel against the man who trusted him and the preacher's heart for the moment fails him. We are all too apt to look to an arm of flesh and from that propensity, many of our sorrows arise. Equally overwhelming is the blow when an honored and beloved member yields to temptation and disgraces the holy name with which he was named. Anything is better than this. This makes the preacher long for a lodge in some vast wilderness where he may hide his head forever and hear no more the blasphemous jeers of the ungodly. Ten years of toil do not take so much life out of us as we lose in a few hours by Ahithophel the traitor or Demas the apostate. Well, that was number one, what causes spiritual depression in preachers? Number two, 
Why do preachers get depressed? Aren't preachers supposed to be super spiritual? And if we're super spiritual, then doesn't that mean we'll always be happy and topside? No, it doesn't mean that at all. Actually, being a preacher means that you're going to be thrown into the lion's den of sufferings. And the reason is that God will have you to be a better shepherd. Spurgeon explained it this way. Good men are promised tribulation in this world, and ministers may expect a larger share than others, that they may learn sympathy with the Lord's suffering people, and so may be fitting shepherds of an ailing flock. Another reason why the Lord allows depression in the lives of his preachers is because we need it to keep us humble. Of all occupations in this world, few present such a temptation for pride and vainglory as that of preaching. Spurgeon described it this way. Poor human nature cannot bear such strains as heavenly triumphs bring to it. There must come a reaction. Excess of joy or excitement must be paid for by subsequent depressions. Secretly sustained, Jacob can wrestle all night, but he must limp in the morning when the contest is over, lest he boast himself beyond measure. Paul may be caught up to the third heaven and hear unspeakable things, but a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet him, must be the inevitable sequel. Men cannot bear unalloyed happiness. Even good men are not yet fit to have their brows with laurel and with myrtle bound without enduring secret humiliation to keep them in their proper place. Whirled from off our feet by a revival, carried aloft by popularity, exalted by success and soul winning, we should be as the chaff which the wind driveth away, were it not that the gracious discipline of mercy breaks the ships of our vain glory with a strong east wind and casts us shipwrecked, naked and forlorn upon the rock of ages. Number three, what are some of the remedies that preachers can use to defend themselves against the onslaught of depression? He first of all suggests that we get outside. Now I know this is something that we've talked about already in this series on lectures to my students because Spurgeon has already talked about it. He was a firm believer in going outside and taking a walk, whether it's just milling around in your garden or going to walk in nearby woods or a city park. He, he was a, a true believer in the power of creation to alleviate the mind of stress and fill the heart with hope. Spurgeon explained, he who forgets the humming of the bees among the heather, the cooing of the wood pigeons in the forest, the song of birds in the woods, the rippling of rills among the rushes, and the sighing of the wind among the pines, needs not wonder if his heart forgets to sing and his soul grows heavy. A day's breathing of fresh air upon the hills or a few hours ramble in the beech woods, umbrageous calm, would sweep the cobwebs out of the brain of scores of our toiling ministers who are now but half alive. A mouthful of sea air or a stiff walk in the wind's face would not give grace to the soul, but it would yield oxygen to the body, which is next best. But also another effective means of defense, Spurgeon suggests, is that we fellowship with other preachers. We need to engage in that holy business of iron sharpening iron. We need to be around other men of God who have experienced similar struggles as we struggle with, who face similar foes that we fight, who understand the heartaches and the burdens of ministry. Spurgeon says, Loneliness, which if I mistake not is felt by many of my brethren, is a fertile source of depression. And our ministers' fraternal meetings and the cultivation of holy intercourse with kindred minds will, with God's blessing, help us greatly to escape the snare. So not only do we need to get outside, not only do we need to fellowship with other preachers, but last and not least, but rather most importantly, is to meditate on Scripture. This is the healing balm that we need. Many of you are familiar with the incident that happened uh, in Spurgeon's ministry at Surrey Music Hall in 1856. 
the church had moved into the music hall because there was no room for them in their previous location. They needed to seat 10,000 people. The only place they could do that was at this hall. There on that first Sunday that they were to meet, on a Sunday morning with the, the music hall packed with 10,000 people, during the service, one man, some, some person, stood up and shouted, fire! And because of that, a panic ensued and people were stampeding to get out of what they thought was a burning building. It was not burning. Seven people died that morning in church and many others were injured. And that tragedy impacted Spurgeon so severely that he was extremely depressed for a long time. And he, he carried the he carried those emotional scars for many, many years, and in fact, probably all the way to his deathbed. He described his recovery from that depression this way. To the lot of the few does it fall to pass through such a horror of great darkness as that which fell upon me after the deplorable accident at the Siri Music Hall. I was pressed beyond measure and out of bounds with an enormous weight of misery the tumult, the panic, the deaths were day and night before me and made life a burden. From that dream of horror, I was awakened in a moment by the gracious application to my soul of the text. Him hath God the Father exalted. The fact that Jesus is still greater, let his servants suffer as they may, piloted me back to calm reason and peace. Should so terrible a calamity overtake any of my brethren, let them both patiently hope and quietly wait for the salvation of God. We do not know what passage God will use to lift us out of our dark valleys of depression, but we do know that he will use his word. And so if you struggle with depression, I encourage you as well as would Spurgeon encourage you to feast on the word of God Read the Bible, meditate upon it, let it bring to you its healing balm. Only God's Word, with God's Spirit, applying it to your heart, will save you from the dark valley of depression.